Hello all of you beautiful people, Jules here for WhatCulture.com and I want to talk to you today about those pesky deleted scenes that for whatever reason never make the final cut and how if they were ever included could have inadvertently changed the entire course of the project. Now this is quite commonplace with the cutting room floor likely so deeped in snipped content that it looks likely what the barbers resembles when WhatCulture's hairiest man Rich goes in to get a trim. However, these are known quantities. These can be added back in at a later date in director's cuts or fans scavenged edits. What is really irksome though is when the scenes that have been planned never get filmed and whose inclusion might have been for the title's betterment or even might have saved the film entirely. So today we're going to talk about the what might have beens as I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com and these are 10 unfilmed movie scenes that explain crucial details. Number 10. Where were the police? Batman. One of the most widely criticised aspects of Tim Burton's Batman is that while the Joker has his chaotic parade in Gotham City, the police seem to do absolutely nothing. Not that you'd likely catch me jumping in to try and stop these louts as I'd end up with a few rounds in the heart as well as grease paint smiled all over my pretty, beautiful, bold face. Well, in the original script, it actually explains it perfectly. Due to it being Gotham's 200th anniversary, a monument was to be unveiled in its honour on an island set far away from the city, which had most of the city's police diverted to it because the governor was on hand for the ribbon cutting. As the statue is unveiled, it's revealed that it was vandalised, sporting the Joker's signature grim instead, and then the island descends into madness. Now I'm no fancy chief of police, but I probably wouldn't send so many police on holiday away from the area that they were supposed to be protecting, but that's just me. However, the film does state that there have been some officers left behind, but they've just been completely outnumbered, and some of them have even joined the Joker because of, and this is what the script says, material greed. I'm not sure how that would have worked out, but at the same time, it does make the lack of the law seem a bit more understandable given this new knowledge. Number 9. Plot holes and themes cleared up. The Dark Knight Rises. From one Batman to another, this entry isn't so much a single scene as a collection of small snippets that explain away some of the nagging issues within The Dark Knight Rises. Now, one of the points that people complained about a lot was with regards to the film's ending, in which Bats flies the fusion reactor out to sea in an attempt to get Gotham clear of the blast radius. A a ton of people stated that if the reactor was radioactive, then Gotham was going to be in for some bad, bad times regardless. However, in the original script, there's a clear and key point made that the reactor is not radioactive, which strangely was never shot. Neither was another section of this ending in which the Batplane is shown to be empty seconds before the bomb went off, showcasing that Batman had indeed escaped the vehicle. Now, this was likely kept out of the shoot because of good old emotional manipulation of the audience, but it's nice to know that Bats was always going to make it out okay in the end. Ah, oh, bless. Number eight, it was a found footage movie. Doctor Strangelove. Now, the original script of Doctor Strangelove changes the nature of the film significantly, and in the most ridiculous way possible. The script notes that, in fact, Doctor Strangelove is essentially a found footage movie discovered by aliens, who end up appending their own credits to the feature and passing it off as their own. Yes, you heard me right. The film is recovered by the aliens at the bottom of one of the famous mine shafts mentioned in the film, the implication being that the human plan to repopulate the planet underground failed and that the human race has has indeed become extinct. It's so darkly comic that it would have been truly out of left field, but one can possibly see why Kubrick thought that it was best to keep this shot out of filming, as the project was bleak enough without it. Still though, imagine that. Aliens in Doctor Strangelove. Bizarre. Number 7. Kirk meeting future Spock Star Trek One of the few lingering complaints about the J.J. Abrams' superb Star Trek reboot is how incredibly convenient it was for Kirk to stumble across an older Spock who just so happens to be on a future timeline and marooned on an isolated ice planet. Well, in the original script, it stated that destiny itself is responsible for bringing the pair back together, and will do so time and time again. With the black hole creating an alternate reality, Kirk and Spock being thrown together is merely a bungled attempt by the universe to correct itself. While it would have needed a little more smoothing over, it is a nice idea and one that is far more palatable than the simple, yeah, we know, just, just like, deal with it, okay? Yeah, fine, yeah, that we got in the final film. Number 6. David's Motivations, Prometheus 
Now, this next one is a little divisive, because some will argue that the ambiguity of David the Android's actions in Prometheus only enhanced the creepiness, but the original script did offer an explanation for him deciding to sabotage his own crew. David explains to Shaw that while he was tasked with assisting her and the crew in discovering the game-changing technology that Vickers was after, he also had orders to ensure that once it was discovered, Shaw and Holloway didn't speak to anyone about it by any means necessary. Perhaps Scott thought that this scene would have made him appear too similar to other evil android Ash, but we'll never know why this scene was never shot. Also interesting to note was that there was another would-be scene which included David implying that it was the engineer's terraforming tech that actually made Earth habitable, hence the company's desire to get their hands on it at any cost. Number 5. Where did the ammo go? Saving Private Ryan Saving Private Ryan is a classic film for sure, though isn't it slightly curious that Captain Miller and his men spend pretty much the entire movie with a scarce supply of ammo and not a single mode of transport? Well, apart from this likely being the norm for many, many soldiers going through this absolute pit of hell that somehow we made it through together, the original script stated that the team began their mission with a jeep fully stocked with all the ammo they could possibly need. And that jeep, much like my love for spicy one pound chili burgers, died quickly after an explosive and painful battle, god my anus just aches thinking about it, and so the outfit now had to move on foot with limited supplies. Now I'm no Steven Spielberg, just look at the fact that I often shoot my videos in portrait as proof of this, but surely this scene is important, right? Why was it cut? Well, just enough references to this event remain in the film, so the audience could say that they feel informed enough, but still, its inclusion would have been a welcome addition to an already brilliant film. Number 4. Stealing Lancaster's Book the Master. Holy hell, what a film. Honestly, I don't think I've seen a more beautifully shot and tragic tale, and there is so much to enjoy here that it's a real shame to see a scene that could have made it even better not make it through to filming. During this dense drama, Freddy is accused of trying to steal Lancaster's book, something that in the original script was imbued with a whole lot more ambiguity and was, as a result, a measure more interesting. The earlier script not only explains the existential means by which the book came around that Lancaster wrote it after being clinically dead for seven minutes, but features a scene in which Freddy had the spiritual merits of the book explained to him, and consequently, he asks how much money it might be worth. Now, this is important, because as a result, a later scene when Lancaster's home has been ransacked, presumably in search of the manuscript, it's far more interesting as audiences are likely to think that Freddy did in fact steal it. If nothing else, it just makes the potential motives a lot more clear. Number 3. Ferris's Source of Income Ferris Bueller's Day Off Given all the crazy things that we see Ferris, Sloane and Cameron get up to throughout this film, doesn't it ever strike you as a bit weird because it's like, where do they get the money from? Specifically, they're going to need money that a high school student likely isn't going to have access to. Well, the script originally explained this away perfectly. Ferris has a chat with his father over the phone where he manages to trick him into telling him where some savings bonds are, which the young man promptly cashes in. Pretty underhanded, but as the movie would say, that's classic Bueller! Classic asshole, more like which is probably why John Hughes decided not to include it, as this makes Ferris come across like a total douche from the outset. It would have added yet another moral wrinkle to the story and would have cemented this as a day that isn't the norm for him, that he had to go to extra lengths to pull it off, but it would run the risk of making him seem unlikable and almost cruel. Number 2. How did Indy know to look away from the Ark? Raiders of the Lost Ark. In Raiders of the Lost Ark, you'll notice that most characters never make direct contact with the prized Ark of the Covenant, because opening it will make you pull an O face that only me, your mother, and all of those unpaid intern film students will have ever seen before. I'm sorry it took seven takes for that money shot, but yes, that is also my one per list. Yet, how does Indiana Jones know that he specifically needs to avert his gaze when the Ark is opened? Well, there is one scene in the movie in which Indy meets an old man who notes the Ark is not to be disturbed. However, this is hardly a proper explanation. In the full scripted scene that was never shot, the man went on to explain that opening the Ark would result in death and that he would need to look away if the Ark was ever opened. There are several other allusions throughout the script also, where Indy prevents characters from touching the Ark, which also, with this previous unfilmed scene in mind, makes so much more sense, right? And number one, Ripley and Dallas's relationship. Alien. Now, this one is rather interesting, as it's a scene that was never shot but was meant to be included in Alien and somehow ended up being shot and used in Prometheus. Now, speaking, of course, about the scene in which Vickers and Janek throw caution to the wind and relieved some stress by making out like they too were facehuggers. Now, originally, this scene would have been in Alien and between Ripley and Dallas, and it probably wouldn't have been crucial in the sense of the plot overall, but would have provided a sense of humanity to the situation and showcased the stresses and strains that the crew 
crew was under. Now, weirdly enough, this scene was shot in test form but never made it to actual filming and featured a stand-in actor. Why this was cut and then made a return to the franchise later isn't entirely clear. And there we go, those were 10 unfilmed movie scenes that explain crucial details. Let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below, but before you go, do you know what else is a crucial detail that we should not overlook? And that is our mental well-being. Whoever you are, whatever you are getting up to today, I wish you success, love, and happiness, because trust me, my friend, you deserve all bloody three. And if you're finding stuff too stressful, if you're finding that everything is getting overwhelmed, then remember these two things. You can ask for help, people do care, trust me on that, and two, you are okay just letting yourself take a break and taking a step back. You can learn a lot from your defeats and your mistakes. It is really important to reflect on them sometimes. Don't let them consume you, but do try and learn something from them. And if you want to chat about this or anything else, you can go follow me at RetroJ with a zero over on Twitter. And as always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that. And I'll speak to you soon. Bye.